This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast. Guess what, Charlie? Um, um, can I get a hint? This uh-huh. is episode one of season two. Episode one of season two. Ooh, that means very cool. We've been doing this. I gotta ring the cowbell. Cowbells. Huh? Cowbells. Remember that? Uh, There's a great Saturday night sketch. Saturday Night Live sketch. My Marianne, did I ever tell you about this thing? This thing was so it's it's red and yellow. I should take a picture and Sandy can post it. And it has these people. Look. Dancing on it. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And my mom had this shelf of things that were souvenirs. People bring her souvenirs, not all that often, but when they did. And she'd put it on this shelf in, in the basement. And it was like one of those places I used to love to go and like poke around. And so when she died, the rest of the family's like upstairs. I'm like downstairs and I wanted the biology book that I loved looking at as a little kid. Uh-huh. And I took I took the ashtray that somebody brought her from Florida. I have it right here in my house. And she had these two, I think they might have been from like a New Year's Eve thing. And I just love it. And so there you have it. And it's here to celebrate the beginning of season two. Season two. That's right. <clears throat> and I'm Marianne Matzo. So grab a cup of tea All right. or okay. Whatever it is you drink, um, thanks for spending the next hour with us. Uh, first half, we're going to have our recipe of the week. Mm-hmm. In the second half, I'm going to talk about Lewy body dementia. In our um, third half, Charlie's going to take us to hell and back. Well, uh, so yes, please make sure buy a round trip ticket. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, do that now because uh, you know you don't want to get be vaccinated. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So for our recipe. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad died when I was 15. He died, was it three days after my 15th birthday in April coming up? And, um, as usual, people brought all kinds of food. And the thing I remember about the food was that somebody brought something that was really exotic to this, you know, 15 year old from Lincoln Park, Michigan, who'd never been anywhere. It was called Texas sheet cake. Have you ever had it? Charles? I have not. No. Texas sheet cake. Nope. Not familiar with it. Sheet cake. Texas sheet cake. So it's made in like a cookie sheet, you know, a flat. And when the cake is hot, you pour this hot frosting on it so that the frosting kind of seeps into the cake. Yeah. And it is like unbelievably good. And so for me at 15, it was a great distractor from everything else that was going on around me and and my grief over my father's death. So in, and since it's April, and so if I was 15 when he died, how many years ago would that be now? I don't have enough fingers. 25, 35, 45, 55, 50 years ago. Jeepers. Yeah. I know, huh? So um, in honor of dad, uh, Texas sheet cake is our recipe, and I'm telling you, make it even if nobody dies. So, you can go to everyonedies.org for the link, um, additional resources, any questions you have. You can email us at mail at everyonedies.org. That's M A I L at E V E R Y number the number one dies.org. Join our Facebook page. You can do all kinds of things. To be loving and supportive, as we know you are. Yes. So, Charles. Yes. I thought I would tell you about Lewy body dementia. Have you ever heard of it? I, I'm going to say yes, but I, I don't know. I'm going to say in passing, but I have no idea when and what context or anything. So I really know nothing about it. So back in the day, like when we were younger, mm-hmm. um. Alzheimer's disease was like, it was just, you know, a big lump of kind of all the same diseases. 
because they look the same and they're there's really no good way to tell them apart until you do a brain biopsy and see what it is exactly that somebody has. Um, about 20 years ago, they figured out that there's something different in the brain and actually in the behaviors of somebody with Lewy body pathology. So I'm going to um, be a little bit of a school teacher in the beginning. Okay. Please humor me because I always think that you guys, like I do, want to understand what exactly this is that we're talking about. So in 1910, um, there was this guy named Fritz Heinrich Louis, who was studying in Berlin for his doctorate, and he noticed that there was something unusual in the proteins of, brain, of certain people's brains that made them act and think differently. But at that time, you know, he saw them, but, you know, is this, was there cause and effect between why people were thinking and acting differently, or was this something that was normal and should have been there? So um, his discovery was that was known as Lewy Bodies, and he published it in a neurology book in 1912, but nobody really knew, like, what does this mean? So a Lewy body, a Lewy body pathology, Lewy bodies are composed of an abnormal intraneuronal aggregation of the presymatic protein alpha synucleate. And well, it's easy I'm for sure you to you say. all know exactly what that is. But for Charlie, I'm going to just bring it. Yes, bring thank it you. Yes, yeah, so just a smidge. Please, uh, please learn me something. Um, so an alpha nucleon is a protein. And let me tell you how that protein works in our nerves. So a nerve, think of a nerve as like this brown thing with like spikes on it, okay? Mm -hmm. And the, there's these spikes are like terminals that can send and receive messages. So when a message is sent, it's called a synapse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the connection is made and it synapses. Right. So there's a presynaptic terminal that's before that synapse happens. And that presynaptic terminal releases chemical messengers. Now, these chemical messengers are called neurotransmitters, neuro being, you know, for the nerve, and transmitter as it sounds. So it sends these neurotransmitters, and it sends them from these little compartments, think of them as like storage units, in the synaptic vesicles. So the vesicles are, you know, where these things are stored. They say, oh, you want to move your hand? Okay. So they let out some of this stuff and you're able to move your hand. So the release of the neurotransmitters relays signals between the neurons, which are the nervous system cells. And this is critical for normal brain function. Well, when you have these Lewy body pathologies, these abnormal intraneural, um, they call them aggregations, but they're, you know, lumps, um, <clears throat> it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. So this protein alpha synucleon wasn't described in really until the 1990s, and it's um, been identified as a cause of Parkinson's disease. Mm. So something that people with Parkinson's disease, which we're going to talk about in a week or two, something that people with Parkinson's disease have, not everybody with Parkinson's gets a dementia, but when they do, it's a Lewy body type dementia. Oh, okay. So you can have the symptoms of, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, of the Lewy body dementia, and... By the timing of when you get those symptoms, you, is indication, is it related to um, al Alzheimer's disease or is it Lewy de body dementia itself? So, Lewy body dementia is a disease called, caused by these protein deposits in the brain known as Lewy bodies. And that impacts thinking, behavior, sleep and movement. It's the second most common form of dementia after Alzheimer's disease, affecting an estimated 1.3 million Americans. 
but it's only been a separate disease of its own for 20 years. So um, a little maybe unknown, or maybe you guys know more about this stuff than I do, but in the months before his death, Robin Williams had um, paranoia, was confused, couldn't remember his lines while he was making a movie. And um, after his autopsy, it was determined that he had an unusually severe case of Lewy body dementia. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, you can read, you know, the different blogs about this. Of course, I got sucked into the Robin William blogs. You know, maybe, and, maybe that's when, uh, I, when I said I thought I heard it in passing. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. It was, it was that. And that's why. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. And people were like, well, but why would he kill himself? And then there were other people who were like, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, in this discussion of it, what I was reading is people are saying, if you know what your outcome is going to be, while you're still able to kind of control that outcome, what would you do? And um, it's it's really a heartbreaking thing to think about that that y- you could be left so desperate feeling and looking forward and saying, okay, I know where this disease goes and I don't want to do it. But we've done a few shows about assisted death and euthanasia. And right. listeners, if you want more information about that, you can go to our webpage and listen to those podcasts. So um, the prominent kind of uh, behavioral symptoms with Lewy body dementia are visual hallucinations. And this is really key in distinguishing the hallmarks of Lewy body dementia. They typically occur early in the course of disease. And the hallucinations are really well formed and are typically of small, misshaped people, children, or animals. Um, You might have auditory listening, what you hear or what you smell hallucinations, but those are far less common. Um, There's delusions frequently occurring in Lewy body dementia, and these delusions um, include something that's called cap gas syndrome. It's C-A-P-G-R-A-S, if you want to look it up, where people believe that a family member or a friend has been replaced by an identical imposter. Oh. Yeah. Um, Early symptoms include um, also sleep problems. Um, And this is often missed in the very beginning of Lewy body dementia. They, They have problems in their REM sleep. Now, I don't, I don't know if you all know, but there are different stages of sleep. And the REM sleep or rapid eye movement time of sleep is when you are in your deepest and you get your most restful sleep. So like people with sleep apnea who wake themselves up before they get into that REM sleep are perpetually tired because they never get into that. Mm-hmm. So um, there is something that's called REM sleep behavior disorder. And what this is, is sleep difficulty, and you start acting out your dreams during sleep with violent movements, talking, falling out of bed. I mean, it's, you're, you're actually there and slaying the dragon or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, daytime sleepiness, people who want to nap or sleep more than two hours a day. Um, restless leg syndrome, those are all... Hallmarks are parts of Lewy body dementia. Um, People with Lewy body dementia, similar to those with Alzheimer's disease, frequently experience depression, feelings of worthlessness, sadness, trouble eating or sleeping. Other behaviors and mood changes include apathy, lack of desire to participate or enjoy activities, um, agitation, which can be seen as restlessness or unexplained irritation. So, I mean, I might have Lewy body dementia because I like to nap more than two hours and I have unexplained irritation. So, um, I don't know. Maybe I'm on that road. Could be. I'm the right age. 
but you see it actually more in men than you do in women. Mm. So there is that. Um, early signs can include changes in facial expression, um, posture, walking, balance, handwriting, um, moving slowly um, to start a movement, stiffness, um, sort of a shuffling gait, uh, diminished facial expressions, difficulty swallowing, trembling, or um, shaking at rest. Uh, another hallmark of Lewy body dementia, which is different than Alzheimer's and different than other dementias, is that there's this fluctuation in how your how your brain is able to function. It's really weird. Sometimes a person can do really great one day, and the next be totally disengaged with a sudden and profound loss of memory. And that's what they saw with Robin Williams. He was fil filming the um, sequel to Night of the Museum. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he was having trouble remembering his lines on some days, and on other days he was perfectly fine. And people thought, "What? What's going on? You know, you don't. You know, we think people don't fluctuate, except with Lewy body dementia, they do. Um, medications. There's no cure. It will progress. Uh." There is medicines that can be taken to help with the symptoms, but you have to be really, 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 really careful because of the psychosis, not psychosis, but the hallucination part of this disease. Some of the medicines that we might give for other dementias could really mess you up with Lewy body. So don't be that person who says, well, my aunt had dementia and she took these pills and I kept them after she died, so I'm going to try them. Please don't do that. Well, please don't ever do that. But in this case, please don't do that. Um, Let me make a note. <laughs> so all treatment for Lewy body dementia is considered off-label. So off-label means that a drug has been tested, it's gone through the whole... Um, uh, you know, scientific process, and it says this is for um, urinary tract infections. Okay, so it's on label to be used for urinary tract infections. But somewhere along the line, people with urinary tract infections noticed that they had other benefits. I mean, Botox was that way. Oh. Um, you know, the, the the stuff that they put on your face to help with the wrinkles. Um, that was that way. A lot of drugs, you say, oh, look, it not only helped this, but it helped that. And then when it's used for that secondary thing that it wasn't tested for, it's called off-label. Oh. So okay. um, anything that's used to manage symptoms with Lewy body dementia, since there is no like on-label medicine, they're all considered to be off-label. So um, there's considered to be like three stages. Some people will talk about six or eight stages. We could get really you know, complicated about it, but generally there's like three stages in terms of the progression of Lewy body dementia. The early stage, there's delusions, there's restlessness, there's that REM sleep disorder that I told you about where they have these really active dreams difficulty movement, and urinary issues. The middle stage um, includes motor impairment, speech difficulty, um, they're not paying attention, paranoia, significant um, confusion. And the later stages is extreme muscle rigidity. And what I mean by that, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody like this, Charlie, where you go to try to just even move the arm a little bit, mm -hmm. and it's like you can't. The, the, everything is so rigid oh, that okay. the, the, the movement is really restricted. Um, there's speech difficulties, very sensitive to touch. You touch them, and it's like, oh, you know, that really hurts. 
And they're very susceptible to infections because they can't move. You know, one of the ways that we manage, you know, preventing infections is we, we move around and keep our lungs moving and the blood moving in our legs and everything else. Well, they can't do that. So they're very susceptible to infections. So what's the end of life what, like in Lewy body dementia? Um, in later stages, the symptoms of Lewy body dementia are extreme muscle rigidity. Um, care becomes necessary for almost all activities of daily living. They cannot feed themselves. They can't go to the bathroom. They can't do these things. And so somebody's going to need to help them with everything. Um, speech is often very difficult and may be whispered or absent. The Lewy body dementia typically causes the individual to become very susceptible to pneumonia and other infections due to weakness, which is usually the cause of death, it is usually secondary to a pneumonia. I mean, even a urinary tract infection. So those of you who are caring for people with um, Lewy body dementia, and you say to yourself, oh, they have a pneumonia, I have to get them to the doctor, and they have to start antibiotics. The sort of the question early on in Lewy body dementia when the person can talk to you is, when you get to that point, do you want to keep being treated for, right. for the infections? It's like the, that preparation you know, we, again to let people know what you want, yes. Yeah. Right. We, for year, you know, <clears throat> centuries, were without antibiotics, and you got, you know, pneumonia and you died. You got a urinary tract infection and you died. Um, there's a, been an old saying that pneumonia is the old man's friend. Because if, you know, if you've got somebody who's, you know, at the end of life and, you know, if you get a pneumonia, if you don't treat it, you will die. Right. And so having mm -hmm. that discussion and making that decision and then supporting that decision um is difficult for the caretaker, but um, if it's what the person with the Lewy body dementia wants, is a very loving thing to do. Well, how how long might uh, <clears throat> excuse me? How long might might someone live with with this disease? Well, I was at God, you're good, Charles. I was oh, just going to get oh, to that. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, sir, Bob. <clears throat> that's our Charlie. So um, there was a study that was done where they looked at caregivers, family, friends of individuals who died in the past five years with um, Lewy body dementia. So they had 658 people in this study, 89% were female, and the ages were 50 to 69. And they asked some questions about the end-of-life experiences for their family member who had Lewy body dementia. So the person with Lewy body dementia is dead at this point, but they're asking the relatives, so what happened? So the things that they talked about were symptom onset and from diagnosis until death, the cause of death, if they had an advanced directive, if there was any end of life education, did they use hospice, where did the person die? So what they found was there was an average of Five to eight years from the time of diagnosis to death. Jeez. Wow. And, but it can range two to 20. And sort of the median was three to four years. So you're talking from time of diagnosis to death, most likely about five years. Mm. Um, respondents indicated that physicians rarely discussed what to expect at the end of life. Um, only 40% of the physicians ever talked about what to expect. And the caregivers reported that only 22% of them, um, gave that, talked to them and something that was like helpful to them. And when that happened, it was the caregiver who initiated these conversations. So the, the doctors know this is a terminal disease. Yeah. They're not bringing it up. And when it's brought up, it's the caregiver who brings it up. Mm. And they're saying that out of, you know, 100, only 22% were really helpful. Um, death 
is expected from this disease, but fewer than half of the respondents felt prepared for what to expect. Why? Now, <coughs> excuse me. Why, why did they not feel prepared? Just a lack of communication. <coughs> Sorry, a lack of communication? Well, as I just said, who's telling them? Okay. They, the, the physician, when they go to see the physician for follow-up, isn't saying, so, you know, we know this is a terminal disease. Do you have your advanced directive? Have you thought about hospice? You know, nobody's bringing it up. Right. It's that don't ask, don't tell syndrome that we see at the end of life or with these terminal diseases. So, Charlie, that's why you and I have a job, is to be able to say to people, you know, Here's, here's some diseases that we don't yet have a cure for, so let's talk about what you need to know and, and then, what the and, end of life is like. Right, and then go out and do it. <laughs> take, take care of that. Yes. Well, you know, we can lead the horse to water. That's true. <clears throat> so, half of them weren't prepared what to expect. 78% used hospice, usually at home or in a skilled care facility, with wide variations in duration. And this is something, you know, I, I, I haunt the um, Facebook pages about all the different dementias and read what people are asking. And it honestly, Charlie, it breaks my heart what family members feel that they must do in order to show their love for a family member. And we're going to do a show about th this whole concept of there comes a point where you just can't do it. Right. And it's okay. It's okay. That's why we have nursing homes with a staff that rotates to take, and they're tired too. And they don't live there, and it's not 24 hours a day, and hopefully they're sleeping at night because all of the symptoms are extremely stressful, and you're going to be exhausted if you try to do it. So we, 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 that's on my list of, to do a show about. Now, causes of death is generally something that's called failure to thrive is the most common cause of death at 65 percent now failure to thrive in adults is just like failure to thrive in children they don't eat um, and they kind of wither away and I see a lot of angst with people about oh my god you know dad's in stage three Lewy body dementia and he won't eat anymore how do I get him to eat well wow. My answer to you is, leave him be. There's a natural progression to these diseases. Right. To life. We all will end in death. And to say, oh my God, I can't lose my dad. Well, first well, off, yeah. <laughs> we all will. And I don't mean to sound flip or anything, but facts are facts. Right. This is part of being human. And so let's start wrapping our heads around our mortality and our parents' mortality and our animals' mortality and everybody we yeah, know. Exactly. Mortality. Yes. And so that's a part of life. So the failure to thrive part when dad's not eating and dad's not drinking, our brains need to say, dad is in his final phase. Mm -hmm. And what do I do to support him in the final phase? You supported him in phase one and you supported him in phase two. So now this is phase three. How am I going to support him? And forcing him to try to eat or drink and tying yourself up in a knot because he won't isn't helpful to yeah, anybody. Yeah, not supportive, yes. So, like I said, 65% will just sort of wither away and die. Pneumonia and swall swallowing difficulties, it's 23%. You know, this is a neurological disorder. People honestly forget how to swallow. They forget how. They don't know how. Oh. And you can put stuff into people's mouths and they'll just hold it there. 
until it kind of drips out the side because you put too much. If they can't swallow it, don't put it in. You're not helping them to have a good death. Right. Um, other medical conditions, it adds about 19%. Because don't forget, even though they have Lewy body dementia, they still have, they're still human bodies. So they could still have diabetes. They could still have heart disease. They could still have any number of things. You know, the, the Lewy body dementia doesn't trump everything else. Um, and because it's a movement disorder, right, there's complications from falling, about 10%. So if you've got somebody with Lewy body dementia who has heart disease and is on a blood thinner and they fall and they hit their head and they get a, you know, a bleed in their brain and they die, well, then that's their complication from falling. You see, that was then their cause of death. So, um, you know, we can, we can begin to think about these kinds of dementias as th there is a final point. There's, everybody's got like a different amount of skill and time and energy and own personal health in terms of taking care of people. But um, really be realistic in what you can do, what you have time to do. I read some, some of posts about people who are working full time and then come home and care for a couple of kids and their grandmother with Alzheimer's. Gee, talk about two full-time jobs. It's, geez, yeah. It's like three. It's like, what? I don't know. I mean, I don't think I'm a wimp, but I don't know how people do that. I mean, my mom had hospice support, and, you know, I went to take care of her, but my kids were at school with their dad, and I, and I was exhausted, and I was just taking care of one woman right, who right. had a stroke and couldn't even move, <laughs> let alone somebody who's, you know, can't sleep through the night and falling and all that, all the other stuff. So, so, so Charlie, do you have any questions about Lewy, Lewy body dementia? No, no, you explained it all, all, you know, very well. Um, so, we, well, I'll, you know what? When so, when you mentioned about um, people, you know, bodies just re reach a point with the memory and everything that people literally forget how to swallow. Um, so you don't want to force food down. Um, so what what do you do in something like that? I mean, somebody can't swallow anymore, you know, because of the Alzheimer's does it literally does not know how to swallow. Um, how? I mean, people at the least have to drink water or have you know water. I mean, what what happens? You don't have to. Um, you you know we we did a whole show on um, the use of artificial food and fluids. Uh -huh. So if our listeners have. Um, not heard that one, they should go listen to that one. Um, your body will, you know, it's it's called allowing natural death, oh, Charlie. Okay. It's saying that we can't stop this. And the, the risk of forcing fluids down that person's throat outweighs any benefit. And the risk being is that they could aspirate it. It could go into their lungs oh. and they'll get a pneumonia and they'll die that way. Mm. So um, listen to, listeners should listen to that podcast on artificial food and fluids because it talks about, because your body is made to die. Right. When your body is no longer taking in food and fluids, it goes into what's called a ketotic state. So in that ketotic state, um, your body releases natural opioids. So it's our creator's way of saying, I know that you're mortal. I know you're going to get to the end where you can't um, eat or drink. And so when you're in that state, your body's going to produce these opioids. It's going to make you more comfortable. So that podcast would be good to listen to yeah. for those yeah. who haven't heard it. So, Charlie, where are you taking us? Um, you were going to take us to Helen back in the third half? Yes. And remember that round trip ticket, folks. Do you 
don't want to, you know, have a you know one way ticket. You go there, and then suddenly, hey, you you can't get back home. Yes, so a round trip ticket to hell and back. Yes. So, with that in mind, ancient mythology has much to teach us about grief and mortality. Today, I'm going to talk about Inanna, the great goddess of heaven and earth, uh, circa 3500 BC to 1500 BC, or as to be very technical, BCE. Marianne, what exactly is BCE? What's the E stand for? Um, excitement, erotica, uh-huh. entertaining. Okay. I was thinking Easter just because, you know, we as we record, this is Easter. So, uh, okay, fine. Somewhere between... En- yes. Entropy. Entropy. Isn't it entropy? You say potato Exis- and I say potato. Existential. Um, excitement. Mr. Excitement. Mr. Sammy Davis Jr. Charles. Never. So where were we? Uh, let's see, heaven and earth, 3,500, 1,500. Yes, so 3,500 to 1,500 BCE, Samaria, Mesopotamia. So her story is the oldest written goddess myth. And what a goddess. <laughs> Erotic, wise, powerful, <laughs> conniving, loving, fierce, courageous, and ruthless. Inanna is called to listen to the great below the realm of dream, death, depression, and the unconscious, because she seeks wisdom. Without knowledge or loss of mortality, she is not whole. Inanna's sister, Erishkakal, is the death goddess. In Inanna's descent to the great below, she tells the gatekeeper that she wants to attend the funeral of Erishkakal's husband. Inanna intends to witness a death, not face her own. She arrives in full queenly regalia at the gate. As Inanna passes through each of the gates on her way to the great below, she is stripped of a garment or jewel symbolic of her power. Now, when she, Inanna, entered the first gate from her head, the crown of the step was removed. Inanna asked, what is this? She was told, be quiet, Inanna. The ways of the underworld are perfect. They may not be questioned. When Inanna reaches the great below, she is pronounced guilty for refusing to honor a power greater than her own. Then she is hung on a hook. In this alarming image, worldly abilities and powers are useless. Even this powerful goddess is stripped and helpless. So there they are, in the dust and darkness of the great below. Erishkakal cries out in rage and pain. Inanna hangs on her hook. All is dark depression and stasis. There is no hope. Ninshabar, Inanna's trusted advisor, gets help. Enki, the god of wisdom, creates two tiny beings from the dirt under his fingernails. These insignificant mourners have one skill, empathy. They witness the suffering of the death goddess and mirror her cries. Oh, oh, my inside! Oh, oh, you're inside. Oh, oh, my outside. Oh, oh, you're outside. I laughed, I cried. Erishkakal, <laughs> the unloved and shunned, grieves for her husband. But we now learn that she is also crying out from the pain of giving birth. Within the deep unconscious darkness, something new is being born. A sliver of light penetrates the dark unconscious and releases new energy. Birth will follow death. Spring will follow winter. The goddess of heaven and earth rises and the cycle of life goes on. We are mortal and vulnerable. We live in a world of catastrophe and chaos, personal loss and social threat. We are thrown down. We are helped up. Miraculously, we find our way to life again. You know what I find really interesting about that, Charlie? Um, is that, uh, it's, uh, oh, it's a rhetorical question. Yes, please, go ahead. What? Is that that Enki, the god of wisdom, Yeah. creates empathy. So, you, you know, we think, oh, empathy is this, is this big thing. But he creates it from the dirt under his fingernails. And I think what they're saying there is that 
that it's just it's just such a basic thing. You know, we all have dirt under our fingernails. So we, you know, sh- should all have the capability of being empathetic. How do you, do, did you notice that? Yes. And then and I got my uh, fingernail clippers and that remedied the situation. So you have no empathy. Right. Exactly. And with that, thank you for listening. Please stay tuned for our future episodes of Everyone Dies. Our thanks to our executive producer, Major General Retired David Gillette, our producer Sandy, John, our technical advisor, Tom Hartman, our administrative advisor, and our friends, family, and our loyal listeners who are supporting our work at Everyone Dies. This is Charlie Navarrete. And I'm Marianne Matzo. And we look forward to talking with you soon. Remember, every day is a gift. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.